Welcome to AM Hoops. Uh, I'm Casey Kiernan, joined by Tobias Harris, one of the great players in the league and great leaders, as we've seen going back to last year in the bubble. But he cannot beat Boban Marjanovic in a game of going for the handful. They're goldfish. I always go for the handful. I got about 73 here. I can more than 73. It was an awesome experience getting back with Boban. Bobby, get the vacuum. You know, they knew that myself and Boban eat goldfish. We we love to have it as a snack. I mean, it's a snack for me on off days, game days. They basically reached out and were like, hey, we want to bring this thing back. Like, we want to bring you guys back together with the best snack to do it, right? So for us, that was like a no-brainer. We were just like, all right, we, we want to nail this. We want to make this really good and have people smile and, and bring them joy to the commercial. So many people love Boban, like from fans to media to players, his teammates. It's like everyone instantly gravitates to him. But you guys, for some reason, have this special bond. What is that about? Why you two guys? I just think uh, it's it's both our personalities click. And um, you know, a lot of things that uh, we're, we're two, peop two people from different parts of the world, totally different upbringings. Um, but, you know, I think the root of us kind of aligns in, in different ways. Boban is such a caring person, always wants to, you know, make sure that people that he gets to impact leave better than when they first came. And that's kind of the same with myself. That's kind of, as, as a person, what I want to do is make change, make impact in the best way possible. Speaking of uh, changing the world and topics of that nature, East Tennessee State, I saw you tweeting about this and I have to ask you, their coach was forced to resign. And to me, I can't even imagine that that happens in this day and age where his players kneel for the anthem and people are yeah. still, they're still looking at the act of kneeling rather than the message behind it. Yeah, I, I, it's a story that's not getting enough traction that it really deserves at, at this point because it's it's uh, it's truly heartbreaking. Um, I've known Coach Jason Shea for the longest. He's recruited me to go play basketball at Tennessee. I know the type of person he is. I know the type of character. Even in the um, pandemic when everything was on a, on a lockdown. Coach Shea reached out to me and asked me if I would talk to his team and just basically give them kind of insight on how they can use their voice and in a certain way, how they can be productive in going about a way to portray a message. And I got on a Zoom call with the whole team and they were all there being attentive and just trying to learn and try to figure out ways that they can do good. and. A lot of it came from ways they can get in the community. So uh, to see that the the university has basically took the message from donors to fire the coach for supporting them, that's upsetting. And it's also like, you know, uh, it's also one of the things that just brings light to the situation that's going on in the world of, you know, my thing is why, why even have an athletic program if you're not gonna allow the young, the young men to to speak their voice and to portray their opinions, and especially in a peaceful way, it's it, it's sickening, honestly. Yeah, I agree, and I also think that this backfired on all the people who, you know, were behind the firing because now not only do they look bad, but it brings even more light. Like. If they were, I don't know, embarrassed or whatever they thought about their players kneeling for the anthem, well, now the whole world's going to see it instead of exactly. just people in their area. So um, let's talk about your team. So you guys have gone, uh, let's see, four and two on the six game road trip, um, eight and three without Joel, whereas in the beginning of the year, I think you guys were like one and five without Joel. The bench has stepped up. Last night, Shake stepped up. What have you learned about your team without Embiid for these last 11 games? It's what, honestly, we have learned about each other um you know we've learned that we can rely on different guys to come up with big nights and especially in the absence of joel we've had to figure it out we've had to find ways that we know we can be successful i think um throughout this whole year doc has implemented a, a system of how we want to play offensively and defensively and we just we just stuck to ourselves throughout this whole period of time 
we've got big efforts from a lot of different guys that were able to step up and and be sharp for us and just honestly be professional and be able to come out and and do our work and, and keep it moving not worrying about you know if if we just if as a team we were just caught up in the oh we were one and five without Joel you know what are we going to do we, we would have just basically shot ourselves in the foot so we we took the time and, and we took uh that whole road trip to really prove something to ourselves that we can win we have good enough team to win basketball games and we're going to do it and when Joel comes back we're just going to continue to build that chemistry as a whole collective unit being healthy and ride this thing out to, to the playoffs yeah and I, I want to ask you about team defense and how that's going to matter in the in the postseason but I have to ask you about you uh, and the year that you're having because in my opinion it's your best year yet but you know if you look at the box score stats a lot of them look very similar I know you're hitting like over 40 percent from downtown but um so just what's been the difference for you this year and why is it really clicked the difference I would say is efficiency uh being really really efficient on the floor um, and the reason that has really uh, transpired is just shot selection of getting the right looks that I want night in, night out, taking my time and, and being patient out there. Um, and that's attributed to my teammates, my coaching staff, uh, the work that I've put in outside of the games and on off days and, and other situations. And that is that has really helped me on, on the floor. So. You know, I just night after night, I try to figure it out and I try to figure it out in a way where it's not forced. It's just in the flow of the game. And that has helped my game just to be able to go out there and be free and to just play in a flow. I feel like everyone's roles on your team are so much more defined this year. Joel is clearly an MVP front runner and Ben is doing his thing uh, on both ends. So. Now about this team defense. So for me, a lot of the nights when I watch, it seems like you guys and the Lakers are playing lockdown D. And for me in the playoffs, it, the two way teams are the teams that win championships. This year seems so weird. Um, just offenses exploded around the league. I don't know how the defense will translate to the postseason. Do you think this year will be different? Or is the defense going to step up around the league when the playoffs come around? Will it matter like it usually does? It, it, history would tell you it would, it would matter. I think if you go back, the teams that are the most successful are the teams that are the best defensive teams. Uh, our first meeting as a team, you know, we, we looked at who were the champs last 10, 15 years, all of them, and all of them were like a top five defensive team, if, if not top three, right? So that's that's just a that's just a real thing. Um, I think this season you're seeing like these really high scoring output numbers. I think that a lot of things to consider with that is um, you know one the game is evolving. Guys are shooting more three point three pointers than, than any other time, and on top of that. Um, you know, it's a condensed schedule. It's a game every other night. That that could play a factor into it. But I think when when it's all said and done, the playoffs come. You you're gonna see hard nosed basketball. And I think when you look at this year, and then you even look at this this uh, playing tournament, you're gonna see some really competitive basketball. And I think that's amazing for the game of basketball in the sport um so we've got members of the channel and a couple of them have a question for you so it's kind of like a lightning round we only have about a minute left so enough for two questions first one's from richard fleming he wants to know what is the mindset difference culture difference whatever between contending teams you've been on and non-contending teams what's the difference around the team and in the building on contending teams there's a more a seriousness to progression day in day out where i mean that by saying uh that, well first of all that's a really good question <laughs> uh, yeah but there's a more seriousness like when you win a game it's not a film session of just all the great clips right of, of the night before it's a film session of good clips and then also a lot of clips where we where we have to get better right and i think that the seriousness of the locker room it, it really uh it really uh wears off on everyone else of 
hey, look, like night after night, this is winning basketball. Like w- this is a, a must win for us. Um, I think on non-contending teams, you have the just the contentness of, all right, like, you know, if we win one good, if we drop one good, if we drop two, whatever, you know, you want to win, but there isn't the urgency to win because you're so accustomed and used to it. And then you get, you know, throughout the course of the season, the, the mind starts shifting to, all right, now I need to play for a contract instead of wins. And that, that's a real thing on teams that are non-contending. You have a lot of guys that are like, all right, this is my opportunity. And um, no, I, I think that's, there's just two ways to look at it. And some teams are in that category because they look at it like, all right, we'll wait for the draft and get this young talent. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But, I mean, this is a mentality shift for sure. And it's pretty cool, the progression we've seen with the Sixers through the years, the process, and now this team. So, our last one's from Hayden Azanaro. Huge, lifelong Sixers fan. He was pumped that you're going to be on the show. Nice. Impact of the new guys, Danny Green and Dwight Howard. Both have been awesome, especially Dwight's been pretty fun to watch this year. Yeah, I mean, those are two guys that just came off winning a championship. So, to get their knowledge and to get their, um, you know, just their experience in winning. I mean, Danny Green has won three championships, right? So to to get all of, all of that in, in two guys has been huge for our team, plus veteran guys that are able to talk to the young guys, have the young guys see. I mean, Dwight Howard is, uh, however many years old, it was just yesterday, me and Mike were on a layup line. We were like, Yo, how is he doing that at that age, right? Like these type of dunks, it, it, it's ridiculous. And um, but but to see like him as a player and the evolution of where he's shifted his game, I think is important for a lot of people to see and, and guys on the team to see because he works harder than anybody. I mean, always in the gym, always training, always talking and, and trying to communicate with guys and get guys on the same page. And that and that's winning basketball, and that's a winning winning culture type player. So, um, you know, I, I, it's been a pleasure to have the the both of them on our team. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on today, Tobias. I really appreciate it, guys. Hashtag go for the handful and go watch this commercial. It is hilarious. Um, it's a contest where you and a friend, especially on TikTok, you go for the handful like Bobby and Toby do, and the winner will be announced Sunday, April twenty fifth. Tobias Harris, really appreciate your time. No problem. Thank you.